Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? So I was led to talk about this this morning, and I'm actually going to link a video from Christian Sermons and Audiobooks in the description that I highly recommend you listen to, uh, because it talks about this same subject. Now is probably the most important time for any believer and it's also the most important time for anyone who is a non-believer and everybody in between. Once the door shuts, there's no changing anything. Once, once, once this age is over, there's no oopsies. Can you let me in after the fact? And this is serious. People need to understand this. It's not just one of these things where, oh, uh, I'm going to be fashionably late. No, it doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. We don't control the door. You even look at the ark. When everybody was in the ark, Noah and his family didn't close the door. God closed the door. They just sealed it from the inside with jute to keep it from leaking water. But he closed the door. And he even tells them when they're beaten on the side of the boat, hey, let us in, it's raining, and you were right. And he said, I can't, I didn't close it. If you're a born-again believer, the things that are going on on this earth, things that are happening to you, the things that are seen, are inconsequential to you. Now, they're important, and we have to pay attention to them because it, 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 there's, there's, it pertains to certain things. But as far as affecting us, it, it's that time has passed. And I'm not saying this to be insensitive. I'm saying this that there's more important things to focus on because our location is about to change. Our... <laughs> our um, state of being is about to change. Um, you watch Chuck Missler and listen to a lot of the stuff he talks about, and I tend to agree with quite a bit of it, um, just from my doing my own research. You know, he talks about the Zodiac, and in the uh, Tanakh, it's called the Maz Mazareth. Um, the way we look at it now is vastly different from how it used to be looked at, because that was actually what they... what uh, Noah and that taught his family because that's how they used that's what they used back then to, to tell what was going on signs in the heavens so I'll tell you guys about Pisces you know how important Pisces is a lot of people don't understand that and don't realize that but the Bible indicates to it pretty pretty intently <coughs> excuse me If you look at some of that stuff, <coughs> excuse me. If you look at some of that stuff and look at what it's talking about, it goes. It it, it it points to what we've already known. You know, you look at the Virgin, Virgo, all the different other ones, Cancer, and all that kind of stuff. So one interesting one about Cancer is uh, one of the I forget what they call them, but Chuck Missler's. The videos on Cornea House, they, they talk about that. But, um, there's some things associated with cancer, and one of them is, um, uh, what was it, uh, Redeemed Possession, which is the church. It's all part of the lore that's in it from way back. If you look at when the zodiac sign of cancer comes up, it's late June, early, early July. Which coincides with Ruth and a few other places. I mean, you guys already have li you guys have listened to me any length of time at all. Know when I watch more closely and more intently than the rest of the year, because to me, the Bible seems to indicate there's only really one main time of year that this whole rapture event is going to happen. And there's a lot of conjecture and discussion that can be had with that. There's a lot of scripture behind it. I'm not going to get into that here, but 
I watched the May June time frame, and so that seems to align with it pretty well. There's other, there's lots of other stuff. You wear yourself out doing all the research. I finally stopped because it ultimately didn't matter. The focus is repentance. The focus is the truth. The focus is salvation. The focus is the time in history, not the time of year. The season is the time in history, not months. The Bible says we'll know the season. We'll know when it's going to happen. That's now. It's literally now. This is the season we're in now. As far as the season goes, don't think it's summer spring summer uh, fall and winter it's it, that's not the kind of season it's talking about uh, that's not the amount of time it's it's a block of years it's a, a part of history that's the season well, we're in that season we've been in that season for a little bit we've been in that season since 1948 technically so the, the time is now to get this figure out, to sit down and make a decision. Am I going to believe in this or not? And if you're a believer, am I going to listen to what he said? Remember what we read yesterday? You call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. Is this the time now we're going to finally get it right? We're going to finally listen to what he says and do what he says? Are we going to obey his word? Now, listen, we can't do it perfectly. I can't do it perfectly. He doesn't expect us to do it perfectly. That's where grace comes in. But what he does expect us to do is to do it, to be a doer, not just a hearer of the word. And so many people are just hearers. So many people are, are looking for validation in places where they shouldn't be. So many people are looking for acceptance. So many people are looking for some type of mystical event or experience to happen concerning this and it's not coming it was never about that <clears throat> we got to stop and think about this because Chuck Mister makes a good point on this what was the greatest achievement God did Instantly, almost everybody universally says creation. How do we know? Well, we got to look and see what it cost God. Well, what was involved in this? Well, creation cost him six days. He exhaled and it existed. So it really didn't cost him much. In eternity, six days is nothing. If our life is a wisp of smoke, that is not existent. What did the event of redemption cost him? His only begotten son. And there are aspects of what happened to Jesus that can never be changed. See, Jesus gained something incredible in what he did, but he also lost a lot too. And he did it for us. See, a lot of people don't talk about this. A lot of people don't bring this to light. They don't expose people to what's really going on when you stop and think about it jesus was god incarnate in heaven glorified he gave that up now what he gained was incredible but he didn't go up he came down He gave up that stature. He gave up that that level to save us. And what's been done won't be undone. See, what Jesus did is far more important than just an Easter service where people talk about Jesus, talk about cross, talk about some scripture for a few minutes and then everybody runs outside and goes and does an Easter egg hunt and then gorges themselves afterwards. That's not Easter. 
Easter is honoring the Lord and what he gave up for us. And it wasn't like he came down and then went right back up to his original position. No. See, before he came, he wasn't a man. Now he is a man. Christ gave up something for us. Because that will never go back the way it was. He sacrificed for us. Not sacrificed and then everything went back to the way it was. It's a permanent sacrifice. He gave his life as a glorified being with God in heaven up for us so that he could become something new for us, to save us, to redeem us. It cost him. We can never pay that back. So Easter is a lot more important than just bunnies and eggs. Easter is a lot more important than carrying around a little palm branch. Because it's the acknowledgement that the Lord lost something in the process of gaining us. It cost him a lot, and we are not worthy of it. So when he tells us stuff like in Luke 13 here, verse 23 and 24, Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When he says strive, we're to be striving. How do we strive? Because people say this and they never explain what it is. How, how do we strive? Pray. Repent. Confess. Give of yourself for him. Sacrifice of yourself for him. He sacrificed everything for you. He gave up everything. Gave up his position in heaven. Took a different position. He came down. The Bible says after all this is said and done, Jesus will be subject to the Father. Remember, he gave up his position. It became something else to save us. I never used to understand what that meant until recently. And I realized it's because he gave something up for us. And we would do well to realize that and acknowledge that. That it's just, it's a whole lot more than just shedding blood on a cross. There's, that's the most important thing, but there's even more to it than that. He was at the top of the ladder before that. He had to come down a little ways to meet us on our level. He had to come all the way down to meet us on our level. But when he reascended, he didn't ascend back up to his original position. He ascended back up to a different one. Striving to enter the narrow gate is acknowledging him and what's been done. Acknowledging our salvation, acknowledging our justification, our sanctification, acknowledging grace. Read what he said to do and then do it. In doing those things comes the acknowledgement. Because it's us saying, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I believe you. Lord, I want to obey you. Now, sometimes we can't always do that due to circumstances. It happens. We can't be perfect in it. He knows that. He understands that. But we certainly can't be flippant and go the other way, like a lot of people do. Oh, you said strive. You're preaching works. I didn't say strive. Jesus said strive. I had this conversation two years ago with an individual. I can't believe you said strive. We're not to strive. That's preaching works. I said, no, I didn't say strive. You need to go read Luke 13, 24. Jesus said strive. Remember, that's not what he meant, but he said strive. 
How about you go look at the Greek and see what it means? See, you've got a problem now because now you're denying the word of God and the very words of Christ himself. Now you're being disobedient. That makes you a son of disobedience. What does the Bible say happens to those people? What does the Bible say happens? What comes upon the sons of disobedience? Those who read the word and don't do anything. Read the word and do the opposite. Hear the words of Christ, but go a different direction. Now is the time for us to get this right. He's revealing these things for a reason, because the time is near. Dare I say the time is here. And while we're still here, there's still changes we can make. There's still understandings we can lock down. There's still things we can do. People spend so much time worrying about other people's salvation. Their salvation is not your concern. Your salvation is. Their salvation is not your, for you to worry about. The Lord will take care of everybody else's salvation. You need to worry about yours. Examine yourself. Just see indeed if the Holy Spirit is in you. That's what the Bible says. Where do we stand in relation to him? Are we on his right hand or his left? Are we standing in front waiting for him to come or are we standing with him? Because as a born again believer, you're already in heavenly places. It's pretty important. These little details matter a lot. And we're going to learn that. He goes on in Luke 13, verse 25, when once the master of the house has risen up, Remember, he sits next to the right hand of the Father. When he stands up, that's it. When he has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? What is he saying here? Well, just like I've been telling you guys. Some people come right up to the threshold of the door and stand there and look in. They don't come in the door. They're not ready yet. They don't want to come in. Well, I like it here because I can hear and it's just enough to give me what I need to do whatever I'm going to do. But I'm not willing to commit yet. And so they're standing outside the door. Some of them wander off and come back. But the group outside the door is bigger than the group inside the door. And the people inside the door were all like, hey, guys, come on in. You need to get in here quick. Look, uh, the door's going to shut. You're going to get left out there. Oh, don't worry about it. We're having a conversation. Be quiet. And the Lord is saying, just let them be. They'll see for themselves. Because when he shuts that door, it's quick. It's instant. Done. Then there's no changing the situation after that fact. He says that. You're going to knock. Lord, Lord, open for us. And he's going to answer. I don't know you. Where are you from? Verse 26, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. Lord, we believed in you, Lord. We had faith in you, Lord. We went to church, Lord. We went to Sunday service. We went to Easter. We went to Bible study. We went to Wednesday service. We took communion. I think we've, this is part of the reason why I don't take communion very often, because we've really corrupted communion. We've really made a mockery of it just like they did 2,000 years ago. Opportunity to get drunk. Well, there's many ways to get drunk, not just with wine. We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. They read the Bible. We read it to each other. For all intents and purposes, these were believers. Because they know all the right things to say. What does he say? Verse 27. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. What's a worker of iniquity? Somebody who practices sin. Practices unrighteousness. It's somebody who makes a point to do it. It's part of their daily activity. It's not somebody who stumbles. It's not somebody who falls. It's not somebody who makes a mistake. This is somebody who openly and knowingly does this. Knowing that it goes against 
the word of God. Verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. Another side note here, he's talking to Jews. So that ought to cause you to pause because if he, what does the Bible say? If, if the cultivated branches were broken off to graft you in, how much more will the Lord break you off to graft them back in? Be careful. Verse 29, they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. This is just one instance of warnings to believers, warnings to people who think they're there. And there's a line, just a, tons of them that are in the New Testament, where Christ himself is speaking, giving warnings to people who think they're saved, think they're there, think they're where they're supposed to be. And then it carried over into the apostles, where they did it too. And it's like, you know, when I read the account of Stephen, or, I'm oh, sorry, uh, not Stephen, Simon, Simon the Magician. The Bible says quite specifically, he believed and was baptized. And what did he get? A, con a condemnation. Because he thought he could buy the Holy Spirit. Your money perish with you. You better pray, God, he grant you repentance. That's a warning to a believer. And Jesus warned more than he did anything else. Because of corruption, because of deception. It's unfortunate that the truth, the actual truth of the matter, has been suppressed so badly by the church mainly, which is shocking, and, and but that's the way it is. That we can read the Bible and speak on what it says and there's a hundred people out there that will tell us we're wrong and will say we need to stop talking and we need to stop telling people the truth. Well, but what does the scripture say? Let's read it for what it says and we can't change it. We can't allegorize it. We can't, you know, put it in the category of, of too mystifying to understand unless you're a theologian that has had years of study because no one will ever meet the criteria to be good enough to say what it says if it disagrees with what everybody else agrees with. That's the big that's the big mystery. That's the big joke. Well, if what you're saying, reading in the scripture, disagrees with almost everyone else, then you have more training to do. Okay, well, how much enough training is enough? Because I feel like I could study my entire life and it will never be enough because it disagrees with you still. Because I'm not going to build my understanding off of somebody else's understanding. I'm going to build my understanding off what the Bible says. And if I hear somebody and they say this, I'm going to go to the Bible and look at it. Okay, looks about right to me. That's what the scripture is saying. Let's go with that. In fact, let me dig a little more and see if I can find more to it. And if it doesn't jive, okay, I'm not going to abandon that one. But that's not what the world says. You agree with us, you're in with us. You can be on our show, you can be on our podcast, you can come and preach at our church. But if you say something that doesn't agree with us, even if it's right, even if you're right in what you're seeing in the Bible, if it disagrees with us, then you can't be a part of our club. Those are the people he's talking about here in Luke 13. The ones that think they got it right and don't. And they suppress everybody who does have it right. Because they don't want to be proven wrong. And because they don't want to lose that tithe money. We have corrupted the giving. People talking tithe, tithe, tithe. It's a biblical mandate. To the Jews, yes. What are we to do now? Give from a cheerful heart. Give what we have. Give of our excess. Give when it's needed. There is no binding mandate anymore. The law was done finished done nailed to the cross now he didn't make it null and void it still applies but it applies differently 
And people get stuck on 10%. I don't know why, because the Jews gave almost 25% because of all the taxes they had to pay. And it's ludicrous to read all this stuff that they come up with. Jesus taught tithing, but he didn't tithe. How dare you say that? But he didn't. You show me one scripture where it says he tithed. Well, he paid his taxes. That's not tithing. He paid his taxes. See, they don't miss that. They miss the mark because then that takes away from their funding. And they'll base their understanding on that. I couldn't have a church because I would tell people, I don't want your money. The Lord will provide me what I need. I don't want your money. Because we've so corrupted this stuff. The same thing with the Lord's Supper. I feel uncomfortable taking the Lord's Supper with other people most of the time because we've corrupted it. We've taken something beautiful and turned it into something terrible. It's insulting what we've done. But everybody calls that church. They call that religion. And then we go to the Word of God to find out it's exactly the opposite. And Jesus warns against those things. And he says, watch out. You may turn around and decide it's time to enter in and the door's already closed. And you might not make it. And how many will there be? Well, they were curious about it 2,000 years ago because they straight up asked him, are there few who are saved? And his response was, strive to enter. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. He didn't say many as a euphemism. He said many because there will be many. He didn't say the road to destruction was broad for no reason. He says broad for a reason. And many there are who find it. And the road to heaven is narrow. And few there are that find it. There's a reason that he said that. And we would do well to pay close attention to his words. One of the things I think that scares me the most is that people don't take it seriously enough. They don't take the words seriously enough. And that's a travesty. Because there's so much more contained within this word that we can learn if we would just take a personal responsibility to read it to ourselves, to preach to ourselves. And to stop worrying about what everyone else is doing and just focus on what we should be doing. But what do most people do? Pastors stand in the pulpit and say, hey, I'm worried about your salvation. I'm worried about yours. Well, you say that to a pastor, watch, watch him get angry. They get angry. I'm worried about yours. What do you mean you're worried about mine? I'm a pastor. That doesn't make you saved. That's like saying, because I'm a Jew, I'm going to heaven. Jesus said straight up to them. You think because you're of the lineage of Abraham, I tell you, you're not of the lineage of Abraham by blood. It's by faith you're of the lineage of Abraham. So all you people that are direct descendants of Abraham, because you walk in unbelief, because you disobey God, you're no longer part of the family. And that was his chosen people. So yeah. When I hear a pastor say, hey, I'm, I'm worried about your salvation, I'm worried about yours too. But your salvation isn't my responsibility. That's your responsibility. But you need to understand that just because you think you have an office, that does not make you and put you in the right place automatically. Just because you hold a position or have a title, that does not elevate you to a new level above others. In fact, it puts you below everyone else. Because it makes you the servant. And they've taken that role and flipped it. What did Jesus say? As God, as Messiah, he girded himself with a towel about the waist. And washed the apostles' feet and said, this is how I want you to be to each other. As the high priest, the ultimate leader, as our redeemer, he served and it even says that in heaven he's going to gird himself and serve us there too. 
that's how he wants us to be here. So what do we see church leadership doing? Exactly the opposite. Pastor is untouchable. You can't ever tell him he's wrong. I say he's wrong. Because they've put themselves in a position that the Lord never put them in. He put, they put themselves in a position they created. It's dangerous. A lot of people in the churches do the same thing. Oh, because we've been going here longer than you, we're, we're, we're higher level than you are. No, you're not. I, in fact, I say you haven't achieved any level. If that's your mentality, then you're not even where you're supposed to be. You need to get that figured out first before you do anything else. How dare you talk to an elder of the church like that? How dare you consider yourself an elder when you don't even obey the word that you preach? But instead sit in the back counting all the tithes, skimming a 20 off here and there. looking out over the congregation and seeing people knowing that it probably cost the last few bucks they had just to drive to church that day. Might be struggling to pay bills or even eat. Car breaking down. Can't pay for medications. And you're buying a million dollar car or a house. The Lord's been good to me. Yep. Just like he told the rich young ruler, Abraham told the rich young ruler, you had your good life. Now you're in torment. And unfortunately, it seems like that's where a lot of people may find themselves. Well, the Lord gave us this word to share it, share with us, to warn us, to tell us to pay more attention, look more closely. Where are you standing? Are you standing in the lion's den with the lion? Or are you standing in the pit with a dragon? I'd rather be in the lion's den with the lion. I think a lot of people are standing with a dragon and don't even know it. It's troubling. The time is now. This is the moment to be changed. This is... Your opportunity to turn, to change your mind, to change your attitude, to change your understanding, to change your state of being, to become born again, so that you may stand in the presence of God. Because once that time comes, once that door shuts, that's it. There is no changing your situation. There is no dropping to your knees or laying on your face or putting sackcloth on and throwing dirt on your head that's going to get you anywhere. It is too late. Now is the time to get this right. Now is the time to make the decisions. Now is the time to stand up for real truth. The truth that is contained within this word. And there are so very few of us preaching this truth. So very few. And we need more people that are willing to stand up and say, hey, that's not right, y'all. Who made you the, the, the arbiter of all these all things true? Nobody. But I have this sh more sure word that tells me the truth. That's what I go by. Well, how about you just worry about yourself? I, I am. And in the process of that, I'm sharing with you the truth, too. But if you choose not to do it, you've been warned. There's no blood on my hands as a watchman. Ezekiel 33. Warn them. And if they don't heed your warning, their blood is on their hands, not yours. But if you don't warn them, I will require their blood, but I'm going to require it by your hands, too. These warnings are there on purpose. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up, sing praises unto your holy name. Father, we thank you for this glorious word. This word where you put warnings in here for us to pay attention. To not just get comfortable and lax and sit back, but to pay attention to what's going on. 
to pay attention on where we're walking, on what's happening, to take the things of the world and lay them to the side, the cares of this life, and lay them to the side. I'm attempting, attempting, attempting to put my back porch back together because uh, the plywood had rotted and I'm putting two by fours on there. Didn't get very far because it hurts too much. But even in the middle of doing that, that wasn't what was on my mind. What was on my mind was our Isaiah playlist. What am I going to cover tomorrow in daily prayer? You teach us to look closer at where we walk. Instead of where other people walk and other people's salvation, look where we walk. See where we are standing. Make sure we're standing in the right place. Because you can't stand on gravel or ice or wet ground and pull on the rope and try to hold the bull back. You have to be able to dig in and have firm ground to, to anchor your feet into to be able to hold the rope. And most of us are standing on ice. We're just getting drug all over the place. Lord, you gave us this warning in Luke 13, just one of many warnings. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say, will enter or seek to enter and will not be able. Because there's a time very quickly approaching us when you're going to shut the door. And they're going to stand there and knock. They're going to beg. They're going to cry out. They're going to pray. Lord, open for us. Lord, what happened? And just like what the Bible says, that's what you're going to say. I don't know you. And they're, they hear these words, but they're not going to understand. I guess because maybe they're marked out for that stuff. Maybe they have to see the light from that angle in order to get themselves right, in order to change their perspective, in order to repent and, and get saved and get right and put things in what they're supposed to be. And it feels daunting to be going over these things. It feels condemning to constantly talk about these things but these warnings are here for a reason you gave them for a reason and we're to preach them for a reason so that everyone will stop and pause and look and say hmm where am i going am i standing in the right place let me examine myself like my god told me to you told us be doers of the word and that's part of it Lord, are there few who are saved? Well, according to your book, there is. There's a great number, but not as many as, as have lived. There's a lot, but not as many as have existed on this earth. And the more I learn about this, the more I think, how, how must you feel about that? What are your thoughts on that? And then I go back to your word and I find it. Justice. Justice and truth will rule the day in that time. And those who find themselves here, the entire churches with leadership that find themselves still here after the rapture because they were doing things improperly, those that take the mark of the beast just to save their own skin, they sell their birthright for a morsel of food. They're literally going to do the same thing Esau did because everything will be messed up. Everything will be, everybody's going to be starving and they will sell their birthright in heaven for a morsel of food, for a bowl of soup, for red rice. And then your word says they'll enter the fire of the flames of the lake forever. You gave us all these warnings to get us to not do that, to stop us from going there beforehand. And Lord, with the season that we're in, with the things that are happening now, with what we see happening, with the time frame that we're entering, the, thing, the little nuances, the little snippets, the little things I've seen in the word that indicate to me a whole lot of things. 
now more than ever, people need to start paying attention to this, these warnings and start looking. Where am I standing? Am I even in the right place? How dare I tell somebody else where to stand if I don't even know where I'm standing? Father, help us to know where we're standing. Help us to see what location we're in. And if we need to move, show us. Show us what to do. Show us that where we need to move and give us the ability to do it. So that we will be standing in the right place. So that we will be in the faith. And so when that time... I mean, how can we tell other people to be in the faith if we're not even in the right place? And this warning right here in Luke 13 expresses that. Help us to be in the right place. To make our salvation sure. To work it out with fear and trembling. Like we do in some of these prayers. These warnings bother me. They worry me. They trouble my heart. Because I know there's a lot of people that are probably in this boat. A lot of times I don't even know what to say. These videos are about the only outlet that I have for this. They have the right words for this. And it's troubling how many have been misled. Lord, don't ever let us miss an opportunity to share the truth with someone. Don't ever let us miss one of those divine appointments. Make us to reach out to anyone we can. Find a way to encourage anyone we can. Because the time of change is just around the corner. The day of redemption is upon us. And once that door shuts, that's it. Are there few who are saved? And your book says yes. How few? We don't know. So let us not focus on what we can't change. But instead, Lord, make us to focus on what we can. To walk the path that's been set before us. To do the works you've already put in our, in our way. And to not be so focused on this world, but instead be focused on you. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your great love that you showed us. The, the sacrifice you made of giving your son for us. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice. of Giving up your place. To come down to our level. To save us. Knowing that it would be permanent. Thank you for this great salvation that we have. And I know we can never pay this back, but the least we can do is listen to your word and do what you say. Call you Lord, Lord, and actually walk with you. In your name, Lord Jesus, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in your name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for joining me for daily prayer. I have these concerns. And this stuff bothers me because I see so many getting comfortable and sitting back on their heels and saying, that's oh, all good. I got everything I need. I'm, I'm good to go. And others going completely ballistic the other direction, going crazy, doing things that they know they're not supposed to do, that the Lord said not to do. And then there are those that aren't even in the ballpark. And every one of those people that I'm talking about are all within what the world considers the quote-unquote church. How do we reach them? How do we help them see unless we preach the truth? And so few of us are doing it. So few people are actually giving real truth out there. Well, and then we get shut down whenever we do because the world doesn't want it. The world doesn't want truth. It doesn't. People don't want truth. They don't want to hear the reality of the situation. They don't want to hear that there's a chance they could be on the wrong side of the door. Well, Jesus said that for a reason. He gave those warnings for a reason, and we would do very well to listen to them. Because once it's over, it's over. Once everything stops, that's it. There's no changing the situation. And Jesus gave us plenty of parables and plenty of warnings to show us that. Heed those warnings. Look and see where you stand. Make sure you're where you're supposed to be before you can tell someone else where they need to be. And in that, we will glorify God. I love you guys. 
I bless you all in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next video.